not, I think we should uh, go on with our presentation tonight. Uh, tonight, Bert Weaver from Dow Chemical uh, in uh, Freeport, Texas, will give a uh, presentation and uh, give you a little background uh, on Bert. He uh, received his BA and PhD from Vanderbilt University, uh, uh, obtaining a PhD in organic chemistry in 1977. It so happens that uh, Bert and I evidently played on the same or against each other in intramural softball. Uh, and we were discussing at dinner table tonight whether we were cussing at each other during his uh, intramural softball team Bravo. game. Uh, but we can't remember any uh, particular altercation that uh, each of us uh, were involved in. Uh, after his PhD at Vanderbilt, he went to the University of uh, Florida, where he worked in fluorine, fluorine chem chemistry with Dr. Turan, and then subsequently joined Dow Chemicals uh, Texas, uh, in Texas uh, Applied Science and Technology Laboratories. Uh, in 1978. He is currently the research leader in Dow's Organic Product Research uh, Department, and uh, I think we're quite fortunate in being able to have him tonight as our, our lecturer. Uh, his title is Perfl Perfluorinated Polymer Super Acid Catalyst. <coughs> that was a mouthful. Yes. I wanted to thank uh, United Catalyst also for uh, putting on the uh, social hour and also special thanks to the Tri-State Catalyst Club for inviting me up here tonight. It's a real honor to come up and talk with you. Uh, what I wanted to talk about tonight is a new series of acid catalysts that are based on a perfluorinated polymer. And uh, as I get into it a little bit later on, I'll describe why they are super acid, why they are such an effective catalyst in uh, uh, these situations. Just to show you a couple of examples of the types of processes that I'm interested in. Uh, basically, what I've worked with is aromatic alkylations, but on this other alkylations as well. <coughs> These are just some uh, examples of industrial um, homogeneous acid catalyzed processes. Uh, where you take uh, benzene and alkylate it with a branched olefin. Uh, using aluminum chloride, make a branched alkyl benzene or detergent alkylates. Uh, you can do the same thing using a, a linear alpha olefin, an HF catalyst. Make a linear alkyl benzene, also uh, one of the major uh, ingredients in the d detergents. Or, as uh, I'm sure people at Ashland know, uh, take isobutane and alkylate it with uh, either propylene or butylene using either HF or sulfuric acid for making gasoline alkylate. Obviously there are a number of problems with these types of materials where you're uh, using aluminum chloride, HF, sulfuric acid. Uh, you get corrosion problems, disposal problems. Uh, you have to uh, clean up the product, separate it from the catalyst when it's done. So there are a number of disadvantages that uh, uh, you'd want to solve going to a uh, heterogeneous if possible. The next slide show a few examples of uh, some heterogeneous processes. Uh, of course people at United Catalyst will know this one. Where they take their solid phosphoric acid catalyst to uh, uh, alkylate benzene with propylene for cumene. The problem with this is that you not only make cumene but you make a fair amount of the di and tri uh, alkylated products and those do not transalkylate back on that catalyst. So those uh, heavies build up and they end up being just wasted uh, from the separations. Another uh, big industrial process uh, is uh, alkylating phenol with uh, tripropylene or tetrapropylene uh, using an ion exchange resin. Uh, make the uh, alkyl phenols, which also go into the surfactants area and that kind of uh, application. The uh, problem with this is that these ion exchange resins, sulfonated polystyrenes, uh, decompose during the use and uh, these beds of catalyst are typically changed out as often as every 90 days. So with the activity constantly dropping on your catalyst bed, it's like uh, driving a, 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 or shooting at a moving target, constantly uh, changing conditions all the way through. So what we've come up with is 
this kind of a structure of a polymer be developed as an acid catalyst. Uh, it's not just Dow's. DuPont has also developed a similar material. Uh, there's also a couple of Japanese companies who, who make these kinds of polymers. Uh, you can see from this basic structure, it's a copolymer of tetrafluoroethylene and this uh, perfluorinated vinyl ether. In the case of DuPont, well, they make uh, a product called Nafion. Uh, this X group here is a perfluorinated propyl ether, and they have one to two to three of those units in this side chain. Uh, in the Dow polymer, there is no extra group in there. It's this ether group directly connected to the backbone. And as you can see here, it's a perfluorinated all the way down and then sulfonic acid on the end. Now this type structure gives you a number of unique advantages in that you have essentially a Teflon backbone. It's uh, very uh, resistant to uh, any kind of chemical attack. Plus you have the fluorocarbon group, which uh, is very electron withdrawing. So it's drawing electrons out of the sulfonic group, leaving your bare proton out there, giving you high acid strength. And I just go through some of these uh, uh, advantages here. The acid strength has been estimated to be comparable to 100% sulfuric acid. Uh, Hammett constant on the order of minus 12 thereabouts. Uh, it has a thermal stability that uh, well exceeds uh, conventional ion exchange resins. There's no decomposition up to 200 degrees centigrade. And as I mentioned, the chemical resistance, you can uh, take this type of polymer and boil it in nitric acid and it doesn't affect it at all. There's uh, no decomposition, no attack by oxidation or acids or solvents. Uh, the, the catalyst life, you can uh, expect, well, there, there is no way to really predict how long it should last. Uh, two to three years life could be uh, expected, but you can uh, even figure that it can be regenerated as well. So that could extend it even more. And the fact that uh, even though you have a very strong acid, those strong acids are uh, immersed in this fluorocarbon matrix, so they're held away from any uh, from outside contact. So it's non-corrosive and it's non-toxic material, very easy to handle and to use. Now these have been uh, on the market for, uh, or, or at least uh, they've, they've been made for about the past uh, almost 15 years now but they have not really made it into uh, extended industrial use, primarily because of these reasons here. They're very expensive materials. Uh, DuPont advertised their Nafion catalyst at uh, $250 a pound a few years ago. And as far as we know, nobody has picked up on that. Nobody has really installed an industrial uh, use for that catalyst because of that cost. Um, they're very low efficiency because just a solid polymer pellet has all of its, almost all of its acid groups inside that pellet. You don't have any uh, direct contact with the reactants to the acid groups. So those acid groups are shielded away. It's essentially unreacted. What happens is that uh, only the amounts of materials that diffuse into the polymer actually come in contact with the acid groups and are therefore able to react. Now, uh, since it is a perfluorinated material, not very, many not very many materials are compatible enough to really diffuse in there to contact the acid groups. So you can see that that's gonna limit its effectiveness quite considerably. And this is just uh, a demonstration of that fact. We're looking at the reaction of phenol with one decene, and uh, we're using as a catalyst various uh, particle sizes of the polymer. We're just chopped up into uh, finer and finer particles. And as you can see here, going from 35 mesh up to 120 mesh, the reaction rate increased by about a factor of seven. 
using the same amount of catalyst in both cases. And you can imagine if you had to deal with a catalyst that was 120 mesh or finer material, that uh, a lot of problem handling problems could arise from that. Uh, it's just very expensive and uh, very inefficient to use. So what we have uh, developed in our lab is a way to take that polymer and support it onto uh, an inert carrier. This picture doesn't show up real well here, but this is a silicon carbide carrier developed by United Catalyst. And, um, it's a porous ceramic. In this case, we have solid cylinders or we have rings in this case. And uh, then we take this polymer, support it all, all through this uh, ceramic carrier, thereby spreading out its surface area and uh, reducing the dependence of the reaction rate on uh, uh, diffusion through the polymer. What we do is we get a significant increase in the ratio of uh, surface area to weight. That's, that spreads out the acid groups, makes them uh, accessible, and therefore the reaction rate is not going to be limited. The way we do the polymer coating is unique in that the resultant coating is not, uh, it, it does not leach off. It, it, it stays on there, it's a very durable coating, and the effect is that you get a much greater efficiency out of it. And i uh, show you a comparison here for supported and unsupported catalysts, again with various uh, uh, aromatic alkylation reactions. These were just stirred flask processes, and then uh, uh, we measured the conversion after 60 minutes. The red bars are uh, 35 mesh uh, napion pellets. The blue bars were our supported material and uh, those were comparing equal acid capacities, 0.3 milliequivalents of acid in the reactions. You can see that there's just a world of difference between the reactivities on that. The yellow bar is uh, shown when we compared equal weights of catalyst, <coughs> two grams in each case, and you can see that the supported catalyst was still much more active than the unsupported catalyst, even though it had six times the amount of acid capacity there. So the, uh, the uh, efficiency was much greater there. We go into a couple of uh, other uh, examples. This is very new stuff, and we don't have a whole lot of uh, uh, data coming out of it yet, but this is just one of the examples that we have. We're taking, uh, again, phenol with a propylene trimer, and we've put it in a fixed bed, uh, set it up for continuous flow, and uh, compared it with Amberlist 15. And, uh, and here are the conditions here. The, uh, reaction temperature 120 degrees, 100 for the amberlist. And over a period of about 40 days, see the activity of the amberlist dropped off to about 50%. This is uh, very typical of what is seen in the industry in this kind of process. This is typically what's used uh, in the industry. See where this supported catalyst tailed off a little bit at first. We think maybe this drop was uh, the effect of water in the feed where the catalyst became somewhat hydrated and then reached equilibrium and it leveled off at about 80 to 85 percent for 100 days. And at, at, we just shut it off at that point. It was just getting too tough to uh, keep uh, dealing with that much phenol all the time. The next slide shows uh, different process, but over a much longer period of time, where we were alkylating diphenyl oxide with uh, tetrapropylene. Uh, in this case, again, amberless had a very sharp drop very quickly, but this material went on for 500 days before we finally got tired of it and shut it down. Uh, and also, at about halfway through, 
we developed some pump problems, so we had to shut down for some repairs. At this point, we took the catalyst out and uh, washed it with uh, some nitric acid to get some of the telomeres and uh, junk like that off of it. Put it back in, and it uh, picked up about where it left off and just carried right on. It demonstrates some of the uh, capabilities for regenerating the catalyst once it's on there. And well, you can see the, the conditions we were running there. My next slide is unfortunately my conclusion. Like I say, there's not a whole lot of data that I've been able to uh, develop as yet, but we think it's a uh, very encouraging, very exciting material, and we are working to try to commercialize it. But we think that what we've demonstrated is that it's a uh, very chemically and thermally stable material. It's a uh, super acid strength. It's quite efficient and it will last a long time. We think that these are the uh, properties that are going to demonstrate that it is a practical catalyst for industrial applications. And I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. You mentioned the life of 200, uh, 200 degrees C is stable. Yes. How stable is it in the presence of steam? In the presence of steam. It would probably be even more st stable at a higher temperature in steam because the uh, the uh, decomposition occurs by dehydration of the sulfonic groups. So in the presence of steam, it may be stable to even higher temperatures. Well, that was a failure of the old sulfonic acid. It, it yeah. the sulfonic acid in the cloth yeah. to the sulfuric acid. You don't think this, this, this material should not be susceptible to hydrolysis at all. We have, uh, yeah, we've done some high temperature steam treatments, uh, actually trying to dissolve the polymer. Uh, and there's no decomposition that we've seen at all. That's pretty good. Yeah. What was the um, reason, or have you tried other supports other than silicon carbide? What's the advantage of silicon carbide over other supports? I think what, well, we happened upon it, just uh, we happened to have some, and it worked real well. And I think a lot of it has to do with uh, just the, the pore size distribution. Uh, maybe something with the surface energy, uh, something there. I, I don't know that silicon carbide itself is that special. Maybe aluminas or other materials could work as well. But it has to do with uh, the pore size specifically, I think. Yeah. It, and one other question. Is the acid strength relatively uniform in this, or is there a, is there a range of acid strength in this material? That has been... Uh, debated a lot as to what the actual acid strength is. Some people have said actually that it's uh, not super acid at all, that it has a hammock constant closer to minus five or six. So it's really questionable. Um, I haven't ever heard speculation that it may be a range though. The acids exist in clusters so you might could imagine, imagine the clusters being of a different acid strength than maybe in a few isolated groups. You would expect all of them to have pretty much the same PKA or? Basically, uh, it would be all pretty close. Acid, all the protons there? Yeah, a lot of the work I've seen show, uh, has been shown as fairly high acid strength, fairly, fairly, fairly constant, uniform. yeah, uniform. Unlike a zeolite or something which has a variety of right. broad acid. Yeah, I think it should be pr fairly uniform. We got a, a couple of comparisons with the catalyst. Uh, the deactivation is fairly rapid. What's the mechanism for deactivation? Just hydrolysis. It's hydrolysis, or you know, in anhydrous conditions, it is just thermal loss of the sulfonic groups. Um, that also is coupled with uh, physical uh, pore blockage of the uh, building of tars like that.
when uh, they shut down these alkyl phenol reactors to uh, dig out the, the spent catalyst in that, it's, uh, it's a pretty tarry gamish, generally. John? Um, I'm a little bit ignorant of this field. Uh, what is amberless first off? I guess. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, that, that's a uh, sulfonated polystyrene ion okay. exchange resin. Second uh, question, you talk about the silicon carbide as a support. Is it really a support or is it more of a dispersant? I mean, silicon carbide is almost a ceramic, very low surface area. Uh, so essentially you're dispersing the, uh, the uh, catalyst in the ceramic rather than supporting it on the ceramic. It's, well, I don't know, maybe a matter of semantics there. Uh, when we do a coating step to put it on the silicon carbide, it's similar to a paint going on there, so you know, it's, it's being painted onto that support. It's just on the surface of it. It's not on the interior. It's in the interior too. It's it's porous, so it goes all through it. it builds the up silicon the carbide carrier is very macro porous. Yeah, the pores are huge. But there's no real, uh, you know, there was a tr traditional idea of the support being an inert medium, but really in this case it is, whereas. Really, a support is not generally now considered an inert medium. Uh, so, really, in this case, there is very weak you would use the term interaction between the catalyst and the, and the silicon carbide. Probably, yeah. If I, if I could comment on the silicon carbide, well, you mentioned the silicon carbide is a uh, agglomeration of small particles having no porosity. This agglomeration creates a large, poor, void volume of high surface area as a carrier. And, and essentially, it's, uh, it's large enough that you can spread a thin coating of this material on it and still retain a large pore structure for, to, to get the reactants in and out. While it is true that you would get a larger surface area for an alumina, it is also true that the viscosity of this material is a lot of poor gravity. We'll get you right back to the polymer situation. What we found in, in early work with the uh, sulfonic resin sort of thing many years ago was that many of these other supports under high temperature and pressure, especially using steam, you literally dissolve the uh, support, for example, silica. And I imagine silicon carbide being much like uh, carbon is pretty inert to hydrolysis or to reaction. Yeah, very right, very um, <coughs> Did you use a solvent with your with your uh, tripropylene and phenol or benzene? No, no, it was just uh, just an EPD. Have you tried the solvent to see what that does to you? No, we uh, we did in in a cleanup step. We did instead of uh, what we did, we shut off the feet of the olefin and then put in a feet of a solvent, an alcohol, I believe, and looked at cleaning off the catalyst. Mm -hmm. But we didn't use it as a reactive reaction. I'm just solvent. curious whether uh, you know, paraffin solvent or coal, you know. Chlorinated <coughs> solvent or something would uh, further enhance your uh, reactivity. Uh, I don't know if it would or not. Uh, you could imagine that in the case of uh, bulk polymer, if you had a solvent that would enhance diffusion, you could uh, enhance reactivity. But we're thinking along the lines of that uh, all of our acid groups are accessible to the reaction so that the swelling of the polymer or increasing diffusion shouldn't help much. But we haven't we haven't looked at it. No. $64 question. Have you tried running isobutane with isobutane? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it does make some octane. It does. <laughs> some, some octane. Uh, Ain't bad for starters. <laughs> and, 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 and a lot of people have asked about that and are looking at that. I'm sure they have. Yeah. Did you actually try to measure the acidity of these catalysts? The acid strength? Right. No. Uh, well, you know, I've read a number of papers on that. 
and there never really was a very well agreed upon method for doing it. You know, they have a few methods where they'll take some indicators and uh, put it onto the solid and see what colors they change and things like that. But when you're looking at a solid <coughs> acid, it's really hard to work up a good procedure for measuring that acid. Strength. You have Hammett uh, number, you're giving it just a guesstimate. Right? It's, it's a real rough guesstimate, yeah. Right? reaction that you mentioned would be a good one to do that. Um, all I have done in the lab myself is shown that uh, straight chains are isomerized and some cracking occurs. But I didn't, I didn't really have a chance to uh, go after that and compare, try to get some kind of an idea from that. So. Well, the second question is, can you isomerize Yes, can indeed. Does that very well? Yeah, yeah, does that real well. The sample that we got would certainly absorb <coughs> isobutene. Yeah. Lots of it. Yeah. And, and convert it to the methyl isobutyl ether. Yeah. And so that branch chain will go up. Yeah. Do you get much skeletal isomerization of uh, small, small chain opens? How small is like butene or something like C3, that? C3, C4, yeah. uh, I would expect so. With that kind of acid strength, I would expect all kinds of isomerizations. Uh, apple groups bouncing around. Uh, I know when we're looking at these uh, uh, phenol alkylations, starting off with uh, alpha C10, as a single peak in the GC, the alkyl phenol product is one big hairy mess of GC peaks. So you know, it's it's uh, different alkylations uh, are different alkylating on different carbons on the chain, and uh, to some extent branching that chain as well. Yes. Your, uh, maybe this is related to this, what you just said, but um, on your biphenyl oxide catalyst, you showed a single um, alkyl chain off that with this alkylation. Does that happen, or is it just you get alkylation on both rings, or just on one ring? No, unfortunately, it, it just on that particular reaction, it does just make the monoalkylate. On uh, just on one ring. Yeah. And I say unfortunately because. Uh, okay. There's a Dow product uh, that uh, requires it to be dialkylated, and uh, uh, one, yeah, some some dialkylate, and this material doesn't dialkylate that well, so it wasn't applicable for that product. It doesn't dialkylate on the same ring either. You know, <coughs> no, like cumene problem. You know, right, yeah. right. Uh, I didn't mention about the cumene. What what can be done <coughs> in a cumene process is uh, take a small amount of this catalyst and take those heavies and transalkylate them back. Does so that work? Yeah, works real well, as a matter of fact. Works real well. So that would be a, a uh, an application where you can use a relatively inexpensive phosphoric acid for the bulk of your catalyst and then have a side stream transalkylator with a relatively small amount and uh, to transalkylate your heavies. You, you've looked at that in a fixed bed or in Fixed bed, fixed yeah. Uh, you know, just demonstrate that transalkylation does indeed occur. You, you have not mentioned cost. Yeah. I didn't do that. <laughs> you have an associate here. What's the cost? We what have not. How much is the dollar? One of the disadvantages is the cost. Yeah, uh, it's still there. Uh -oh. What we're. What we're looking to do is to price the material according to what it's really worth in, in 
in terms of its life. So what we expect is that it would be not all that much more expensive than existing catalysts, but spread out over a much longer life. And uh, to be frank, we haven't set a price for it yet. We're no. working on that at the moment. Yeah, I did not uh, make this more relative. He's talking about this refined. Uh, a polymer of this type was $300 a pound. Yeah, I, I heard that. The, the phosphoric acid uh, supported catalyst that we supply for the cumene, for instance. We supplied it, what, about $1.75 a pound or something? Yeah, about $1.65. That, that particular cat. This, but this is really interesting from the standpoint of its selectivity and special application. And, and it'll, it'll, it'll have its niche. I would think that the, uh, you know, in the chemical by, industry sometime, yeah, somewhere. By effectively supporting it so you really get maximum effectiveness of that model, the polymer, you, you're going to be down in you know, in the five to ten dollar range, because you you don't have support basis. Unsupported basis. <laughs> no, I think you. I think you'll be amazed at how effective you'll make that thing as time goes on. Because it's really a matter of extending that polymer, so it's it's not coiled up, but in fact it opens. That's right. And uh, I'll want to be master of that skill. I'm sorry, like what? I, I have seen one reference, I think, in the literature. I think George Ola did uh, that type of reaction in some of his early work using the Napion catalyst. Uh, I haven't looked into it much myself, but uh, yeah, I think it would. Uh, uh, I think it would work real well. Not too much of that. It's still pretty incompatible with the fluorocarbon phase, but you, uh, if you build up too much of the telomeres then that sort of coats out over your catalyst and then uh, blocks its reactivity. Um, that's one problem that you'll be facing with that. So a solvent might help you. It could, that's right. What is the eventual deactivation a result of, and uh, is it uh, able to be reactivated? As long as it's not heated above a couple of hundred degrees centigrade, the only deactivation we've seen is just physical blocking of uh, tars and things like that. And if those tars can be dissolved or reacted off, then that leaves the catalyst un unaffected. So your well, the data didn't really suggest that you could reactivate the catalyst. You just said it continued on that. You know, you, when you said you washed it with nitric acid yeah. and stuff like that, it didn't increase the activity back to the original. The actual, yeah, that's true. The actual. I stayed pretty much where it was. Yeah, the, uh, on that actual curve there, the points, it, it, it was a little bit above, it, but came right back down to it. And uh, what we think that drop off was is uh, building up some of the things that we couldn't really dissolve off of it very well. We just got heavier and heavier. But Sometimes you have a little bit of trace of dolphin, you know, and that's what's getting you. Yeah. You know, dolphin's plumerizing. Uh, so. Pretty heavy polymer. There are no other questions. I think we can thank Bert Weaver one more time.